All right, Jose, what are you working on, man? I'm open, man. Whatever people want to work on, I'm open to it. All right. Well, how about uh, I'm going to go back to the same agent. It was the market. It wasn't what he did. Got it. Okay. So it, essentially, you're still going to be selling this property, but it sounds like uh, the goal is to just go back to the same agent that you were already uh, listed with. 100%. Yeah, we're definitely selling. Um, I don't think it was fair to him because he worked hard. Yeah, and I respect that 100%. Um, let me ask you this, just out of curiosity, like once you ultimately sell this property, like where is it that you're looking to to move to next? Uh, looking to go to Irvine. Got it. Congratulations. Excited, nervous. How, how, how do you feel about the move to Irvine? Um, I mean, a little bit of both, but, you know, um, we, we got to, you know, get this part done, right? So. Got it. So basically, a yeah. little bit of nervousness, a little bit of his excitement. At the same time, the priority is, is this sell this property, in other words. 100%. Correct. Good. And then in terms of timing, I know that's important for a lot of people. Probably the most important thing. Like, what's an ideal time frame for you to have this home on the market and then ultimately be out in Irvine already? Uh, we probably try in about, um, uh, I don't know, I mean probably be back on on the market in about a month or so and just wanted to take a break got it so a little bit of a break and then putting it back on the open market hello john yep that's correct so a, a little bit of a break and then putting it back on the open market yeah one month got it so can, can i can i make a recommendation to you uh john sure so i'm not sure if you're open to this what most agents do when a property does come off the marketplace is they typically take the time to interview a couple different agents just to get a couple different opinions about price, commission, and then also marketing. Is that something that you're open to at all? Um, I mean, I, 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 listen, I told them that uh, I would give them the listing, right? So I don't want to go back on my word, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not asking for you to go back on your word. Here's the good news for you, John. Um, the only thing I'm asking is just an opportunity to interview. When we meet, you can take the information that I give you. If you find something that's like, wow, like this is great. You could even share it with that agent. And then at that point you can decide, okay, do I want to continue working with the agent or do I want to go in a different direction? Do you really have anything to lose, John, by meeting with somebody that sold $80 million worth of real estate in the last 12 months? Um, I mean, I guess not. But listen, you know, I don't want to sign anything. You know, I'd be happy to compare it. And, uh, you know, ultimately, I think I still go back to the same agent. Yeah. And I'm OK with that, John. And just so you know, I actually really appreciate the transparency as it relates to that. I'm OK with you not signing anything. What this is about, it's really about you. It's about helping you get to Irvine. And it's about you getting an opinion from a top agent before going back with the same strategy. So if we were to get together, is there typically a time or day of the week that would work out better for you? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm open this week. If you want to come by again, like, you know, I, I, I don't have to sign anything, right? Nope, absolutely not. Okay. So if we were to get together, um, I'm looking here. Uh, would you have time today at three or tomorrow at five? Uh, tomorrow at five. Got it. Perfect. All right. Good. Awesome. So, so here's the thing about the I'm not signing anything. When I'm talking to people, I've had people that are like, oh, yeah, I'm ready to go. I'll be signing with you tomorrow when we meet. And then I meet with them and they don't sign anything. And then I've had people that are like, I'm not signing anything. And then I meet with them and they sign. So what's the, what, what's the key? Is it them telling you that they're going to sign or them not telling you that they're going to sign? No, the key is how good is your presentation? That's the key. Hmm. So when I was young, 
people would be like, oh, yeah, I'm ready to go. I'm when fine. He would- I'd show up, <laughs> and I would mess up the presentation. I would either mess up the prequel and start off with, if what I say makes sense and you feel comfortable and confident, and they'd be like, and I'd turn them off, or at the presentation, I would say something that wasn't in alignment with what they wanted to do, or I came off like, like, uh, like uh, I wasn't looking it out for that. I came off. That doesn't mean I wasn't looking out for their best interest. I came off because of dialogue. So the reality is that if they say I'm not signing anything, it doesn't mean anything. The most important thing is, are are you going to give him a presentation that is focused on helping him accomplishing his goals? And if you can, your chances of conversion are really high. Even if they say like, I literally went on an appointment last Saturday. They're like, yeah, just so you know, we're not signing anything with anybody. And I'm like, okay, great. Not a problem. I meet with them. I give them a presentation. They look at each other. They're like, do we need to think about it? Like, nope, I don't need to think about it. This is the guy. I'm like, okay. And they're like, I'm ready to sign. I'm like, all right, let's do it. So I just want to be clear because most people get caught up on that. They're like, oh, well, they said that they're not signing anything. It doesn't matter, guys. Mm. It doesn't. It's just, are you giving a presentation that is consumer oriented, that solves their problems and allows them to accomplish their goal? And do they feel like you're the right person for the job and you're going to look out for their best interest? And by working with you, are they going to be able to accomplish their goals? So, yeah, what's the difference between a good presentation and a bad presentation where they sign or not? Um, so the way I try to do my presentations is, or not try it, the way I do my presentations is I look for problems that they have and then I come up to solutions for their problems. So either in the prequel, problems will come up or when I'm doing the walkthrough, problems will come up and then I'll come up with solutions. So like, I'll give you an example. Like the last one that I went on was on Saturday and um, they basically told me uh, like, we're doing a walkthrough. I could tell that like the carpet needs um, work. They told me in the prequel that they're considering doing work to the property or selling it in as is condition. Uh, Property is vacant. Um, and they're telling me that they want to do some things. So if they're telling me those are essentially problems, I came up with solutions to those problems, basically. And then once I came up with solutions to their problems, it was about how can I make your life easier? So I'll give you another example. They told me that they had some things like some items in the living room that they were having in a state sale themselves and that they were going to have to move into the garage. And the guy was like, literally, the guy was maybe like 65 or somewhere in age. So what I told him is, I'm like, look, what if I could actually help you move these items in the garage so that you don't have to move them? He looks at me, he goes, you would do that? I'm like, 100%. He's like, oh my God, that would make my life so much simpler. That would help me out so much. Hey. I'm considering doing some carpet work and I'm considering doing this. Hey, what if I told you that I would actually coordinate all those things for you? I would get you estimates. And if you like the estimate, we can move forward with those renovations. And if you wanted me to, I could even pay for those renovations up front and get reimbursed at the close of escrow. They look at me, they're like, you would do that? Hell yeah, for a... For a twenty-five thousand dollar commission, man, I would. I, I'm not saying like for that part, but I'm just thinking out loud. For a twenty-five, think about how much. Think about like if you had a traditional job, how much you would have to do for twenty-five thousand dollars. Think about that. Not a lot of money. Yeah. Think about how many people work half a year for twenty-five thousand dollars. Think about all the Mexican immigrants, bro, that have to work in the fields in the rain, cold, for fifty thousand dollars a year, for half a year. And I had that opportunity to earn that in one paycheck. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. You do whatever it takes, guys. I mean, $25,000. Yeah. Let's, let's, uh, let's provide some value and customer service. Right. So that's easy. So e- even like, um, like, uh, uh, there's a new agent that's going to start working with us. And he's like, Oh yeah, we have a, we're, your home sold guaranteed. And I told him, I'm like, Hey bro, you realize that w- whenever you meet with people, they think that's a gimmick. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I have competed against you guys so many times. And the feedback that I get on that is people don't think it's true. He's like, well, it's actually not true. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, if you read the fine print, there's like all kinds of like <laughs> caveats. I'm like, okay, cool, whatever. I'm like, he's like, what's the key to a listing presentation? The key to a presentation is finding a problem or multiple problems and pitching the solutions to those problems. And if you can do that where you're making their life easier, the chances of them wanting to work with you are higher. Mm. Got it. Got it. Yeah. It's a, basically it's a hook. It, it, you have to pre-qualify. You have to go buy my price. Right. So, yeah. It just, it. It, it just like, instead of having like one thing that you pitch every single time, that one thing may not be applicable to everybody. Keep in mind, different people have different needs and different people want different things. Some people want to sell as is. Some people want to do work to the property. Some people don't want to like do work to the property. Some people want to stage. Some people don't want to stage. Some people want um, to get it sold fast. Some people want top dollar. Some people want finance. Some people want cash. Some people want private offers. Some people have tenants in the property. <laughs> Some people have uh, Ill, people with, that are ill in the property, you know? So it's a matter of understanding what are their problems and how can I help them solve those problems? And if you can help them solve their problems, a byproduct of that is a listing. And just think about business. That's all business is. Mm. All business is, is, is there a problem? Can I solve that problem? Amazon exists. There was a problem. They said, how can we make this a more pleasant experience for customers? They solved it. Uber exists. There was a problem. They were like, how can I make this taxi business a more enjoyable process? And they solved that problem. Mm. That's all business is. Looking for problems. How can I solve the problem? And how can I make the customer's life easier? You can do that. You're going to win. Yeah, it comes back to listening uh, intently instead of, you know, listening to respond quickly, rapidly, just so you could say something. It's really understanding what their problem is and bringing that solution to them. Yeah. Um, it's as simple sure. as that. It's as simple as that. And if you can find out what their, you know, their problem is in solving that, uh, you get the listing. And yep. it's as simple as sometimes people don't listen and they're like, okay, he's dead in the water. Like this guy didn't listen to what I wanted. And it's as simple as that. So. Agree. Yeah. Aaron, what do Aaron, you think? What's, Aaron, what's your feedback on that? Yeah, spot on, bro. Like what I'm aware of is uh, for those people who actively prospect, the kind of dominant uh, prevailing thought process that has been shared with them is very egocentric, like about me and how good I am and how many homes I sold and like, you know, don't you know who I am? And while your home was on the market, I sold 15 properties, blah, 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 right? And it's completely counter to what people actually want, right? So if I'm leading with that type of stuff, it's because I'm actually insecure. I'm sure you've been in like a personal context with somebody who talks about themselves all the time. Like, what do you think about that individual? You're like, yeah, he or she is insecure. That's why they're talking about themselves all the time. They're trying to overcompensate for that insecurity. Where coming from a place of contribution, which is what Jose is saying, right? Specifically, what is your issue and how can I help and how can I be of assistance and how can I serve you is really what everybody on this call actually wants in their own life if they're dealing with products or services or you know looking for somebody to help you in some way so i know it sounds like verbal gymnastics but it's not okay intention is like a colorful dye so imagine if you had like food coloring it was red and you you put one drop into a glass of water well initially you're not going to be able to tell but as you continue to put drops in the water would become pink and then eventually it would become red 
And if your intention is to take instead of to serve, I promise you it'll come across in your language. It'll come across in your tonality. It'll come across in your musculature. It'll come across in your body language. Like you, you won't be able to hide it. You have to be a psychopath to be able to hide what your intention is, right? And you, everybody on this call has been around somebody whose intention is to take something from them and you can feel it. It's not, they didn't come out and say, hey, Jose, I'm trying to take something from you. Like you can tell, right? Based on tonality, based on kind of um, language that they're using, based on, you know, their physical being physical and being. things of that nature. So uh, asking myself a question. So if my intention is to take, that has a particular approach that's associated with it. If my intention is what's in it for me, that has a particular uh, approach that's associated with it. If my intention is to serve, which is what Jose is saying, that has a different approach, right? If you notice, he's not bragging about himself and that he did two point whatever million in GCI and how he's the man and you know he has all these followers. He's not doing any of that. Instead, he's just asking simple questions. Hey, you know, I'm curious for you personally, if we were able to help you with that particular issue, would that be useful in some way? Oh my, you would do that? Yeah, absolutely. For you, 100%. Well, you know, no other agent has said that to me. Well, it sounds like you're beginning to see why people like you hire me all the time for the job. May I make a suggestion? And then just close, right? So it's a combination of knowing what to say and how to say it. And I think people overestimate that, right? So they put way too much value in that. And now it is valuable. What's equally, if not more valuable, is what is your intention? Is my intention to prove myself worthy, which a lot of you guys do, with the, you know, uh, don't you know who I am? And I sold all these properties and like, you know, I sold 50 homes while yours is on the market. That's trying to prove yourself worthy. Or is it to connect and to serve in some way? Is my intention to prove myself right? Do you know how many of you guys get into arguments with people? Like what Jose's saying, people want different things. So they're like, oh, I just want to cash off. And you're like, no, 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 no. I want to list your property and you could get more money. Like you're arguing with them instead of just giving them what they want. Right. And And here's the thing about the cash offer, guys. Most people think that they want a cash offer until they actually get the price that a cash offer comes in at. Like I receive so many people that are like, look, I want a cash offer. I'm like, great, I'll make you a cash offer. Not a problem. And I'll be like, all right, look, this is what it comes in at. And they're like, what? Like their expectations of what the cash offer is to re to 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 where the market is are different. They think that they're gonna get a a market Retail. value cash offer on the table. So once you weed that out and you explain to them that this is the way that investors work, that most investors are going to buy at 60, 65, 70, 75% of the ARV, they're like, okay, I'm not going to work with an investor. And then the next logical step is to work with a real estate agent. But instead of making them wrong that, no, you can get more, you give them what they want. You yeah. know? In yeah. other words, in that context, like here's how you would structure that. Let's say that like, look, I just want a cash offer. Okay, no problem. And we can certainly uh, provide you with one because we work with investors all the time that are knowledgeable. They have integrity. You know, if they say they're going to do something, they do it. What I find, Jose, is oftentimes homeowners like yourself, their initial inclination is like, I just want a cash offer because they're imagining it would be at retail. And I'm sure you recognize that investors' intention is to make a profit. So it's usually like 75% of what you could get on the open market. Is that something that you're actually open to? Or is it more important to you to maximize value and get top dollar? And then be quiet. So, so before before I get into that, I would ask them, how much do you want for the property? Yeah. Be like, and, and that will tell me which direction they're leaning towards. And yeah, it'll tell me which retail. direction to go in. Exactly. So let's say they tell you like retail, like something they saw on one of these online sites. It's like, okay, well, it sounds like, truthfully, Jose, you're really interested in like retail. And I'm sure you're aware that, you know, investors, their intention is to make a profit. So it's usually going to be less than retail. So what I can do for our time together is I can bring you a cash offer from an investor. Yep. You can review it. And again, there's no obligation. Whatever you decide is fine. The second thing I'll do is I'll do a competitive market analysis an equity, you know, kind of snapshot as to what you could expect to receive on the open market if you did decide to do that. And net, net bottom line, what the proceeds would be to you and your family. And then at least this way, Jose, whatever you decide, whether you decide to go with the cash offer or you decide to put on the open market, you'll have all the information you need so you can make the decision that you feel is best in terms of how to proceed. Does that sound fair to you? Now, what most agents will do, guys, is they will argue with them that listing the property is better. 
because you're not listening. You see what I'm saying? You're not doing what Jose is proposing or suggesting to you. Guys, you don't do 2 million in GCI by fucking accident. Okay? And you definitely don't do it by arguing with people all the time. So instead, ask questions. You know, like, like what is your ultimate goal and objective here? I, and, you know, and, sometimes people and, and have solutions to their problems. Yes. And have main solutions. thing, have solutions that like, right. Anytime they tell you something, be like, okay, this is a problem. What is my solution? This is a problem. What is my solution? Start coming up with solutions to their problems. The person yeah, so that has go. the more, most better solutions to their problems is the person that's going to win consistently over time. The better solutions and they come from a place of contribution is going to win. Yeah. So like what came up for me is let's say they're like, yeah, you know, I don't want to deal with putting it on the open market. I understand. And, you know, I oftentimes find that homeowners like yourself, they imagine that it could take an extended period of time. What if I told you that with the right strategy and the right approach, it would only take like a week to be acceptable? Would that time frame work for you if it meant you could net more money? Or would you not want to deal with that week and just take a cash offer? And then sh quiet. And they'll be like, well, you know, if it only took a week and how much money are we talking about? You know, it's interesting. I don't know because I haven't done the homework. It's not uncommon. It could be tens of thousands of dollars, 10, 20, $30,000. And that's meaningful for most people. It sounds like it could be meaningful for you. So with all of that being said, may I make a suggestion? And what I'm doing is asking permission to close. I'm quiet. Now you may and have you, to wait. Go ahead. And you came up with a solution to their problem. A solution to the problem. So then I'm like, okay. And I'm quiet for like, could be 10 seconds, could be 30 seconds seconds it seems like a long mission to close do not speak until they say go ahead or okay george i'm listening or you can make a suggestion whatever they say well based on what you've been kind of to share with me i'm hearing a couple things from you very clearly the first is you're going to sell it is not a question of if it's just a question of how you're going to sell whether it's to sell privately to an investor type or on the open market the second thing i'm hearing from you is the more information that you can gather with regards to both of those options in terms of what you could expect to receive as a cash offer and what you could expect on the open market and how long that would take, the better equipped you'll be, Jose, so you can decide what's best for you and your family. So what I'd like to do is this. I wouldn't mind, I'm in the area all the time anyway. Love to have the opportunity to pop by, take a look, see what it has to offer. While I'm there, I'll show you those two things very clearly. The first is, is I will bring a cash offer with me from an investor that we work with all the time, high level of integrity, does what they say they're gonna do when they say they're gonna do it. And that's reflective of you know the type of cash offers that you could expect to receive if you go that route. The second thing I'll show you is on the open market with the right plan and strategy in place in about you know seven to 10 days, what you could expect to receive and net net bottom line what the proceeds would be. And then at least this way, whatever you decide to do, you'll have all the most important information you need so you can make the decision for you and your family that you feel is best. Does that sound fair to you? Now notice, who is that all about? Them, have I said once how cool I am or how awesome John Sy's haircut is? Or how fucking I have all of these followers and I sold a home in your neighborhood. Not fucking once. Do you see? Like yeah. imagine the moment you walked into like a donut shop and you're like, hey man, can I get a donut? And they're like, hey, uh, I don't know if you know this. Amber, I'm kind of a big deal making donuts. Do you see that plaque on the wall? I won donut champion in this little town. 10 years ago, I'm kind of a big deal. You would like literally walk out. You wouldn't even buy the damn donut. Do you see what I'm saying? But yet we do this as an industry consistently all the time. You ready? Here's, here's a, a mantra for 2024. Stop it. Stop doing that. It's just a sign of insecurity. Lead with value, ask questions, figure out what the problem is. Once there is a problem, and I know that I have a solution, then you're gonna get the velvet hammer, then we're gonna close. But not until then. You know, I, I watch these agents, they're like, they're like, yeah, you know, are you thinking about putting your home on the market? They're like, we're not sure. Great, that means we should get together and discuss your options. Like, bro, what are you doing? So amateur, bro. It's like amateur hour. He said he's not sure. <laughs> You know, you, know? So you gotta dig, you gotta find out gotta more dig, information. Bro. Oh, and then, so what I would do in that instance is I would be like, okay, Jose, my job's to help you. It's never to talk you into doing anything. You know, I, I'm, I'm curious when you have a regional market, super nice in a great area. I mean, 
I don't need to tell you that. Was there any particular reason you were even thinking about selling it? Let him talk to me. Well, you know, this and that, blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. And is this and that still important to you or have things changed forever? Like you just got to keep, keep, I reserve closing for when they've demonstrated to me that they have a problem that I can help them with. Yeah, agree. Not, yeah, not everybody you're going to close on it. The other thing that I think is important when presenting, John, is building up trust. Because I think that without, so, and this is kind of something that I thought about. So why do people work with friends or family? Because they trust, they trust them. They trust them. So that's the biggest objection that you're going to get. So I think that in a real estate transaction, you can be the number one agent. You can be have the greatest track record. You can have a thousand homes on your record. But if they don't feel like you're going to help them and they don't trust you, they're not going to work with you. They're going to work with their friend. They're going to work with their neighbor, even if their friend or neighbor has only sold one property. So the question becomes if trust is one of the most important factors when working with somebody, how do you build up trust? Here's what I would propose you do. One, you demonstrate you're not attached to the outcome. I right would say up. that. I would say agree Number with two, that. What I would propose is you put their interest ahead of yours. And you, you, in your communication and in what you're trying to do, you demonstrate that. So like, I'll give you an example. What just popped into my head is, let's say you're talking to somebody and they got an offer from an investor. And it's cash and it's on the table and they're thinking about taking it. And you swoop in as an agent. You're like, well, you know, we can get you more money, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, listen, you know, what I'm aware of is it seems like the path of least resistance is to just to go with that cash offer. And I know that the only reason it would make sense to have somebody like me help you is if we could net you more minus commissions than what that cash offer will net you. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to do it. So what I'd like to do is just ask you a couple of quick questions just to make sure that I can provide you with the most accurate information possible. And I want to be clear, Jose, if it makes sense to take that cash offer, I'll tell you. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. So look what I did there. I'm not attached to the outcome. And does Jose feel like I'm actually have his best interest at heart? Yes. Do you see? And then if he tells me, he's like, yeah, we got an offer at like 155. And I'm like, okay, cool. Or whatever it is, 555. Awesome. Well, you know, what I'm aware of is on the open market, it really seems like we could probably get you like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 more, but minus commissions, it's kind of the same. So truthfully, may I make a suggestion? Yes, go with that offer. Now, I do find that sometimes clients like yourself, because they're dealing with, you know, savvy investors that are professionals, they want somebody like me to help them facilitate the transaction. Like maybe like be on their side, look out for their best interest, make sure all the paperwork's done, T's are crossed, their I's are dotted. Actually at a much reduced fee, is that something you think could be helpful or useful to you? Do you see? Well, you came up with a solution to that problem and you were transparent and you told them what was in their best interest as well too. You told them, look, like to, it, I've had that happen so many times where like I had a guy call me and say, Jose, look, I have an offer at X. And I told him, look, if it's at X, just go for that offer. Like we're probably going to end up right around the same number if you work with me. So just go with that offer. And it turns out that they're trying to renegotiate him now. So now I'm coming back into the picture because he's doing it for sale by owner. So he's not like listed with anybody. So nobody gets the wrong impression. But the other thing I was going to say that I think builds up trust and I'll share a story with you guys. So I was buying a, a car in 2015. It was a used car. It was a 2013 Mercedes Benz because my buddy Angel had been teasing me. And just so you know, Angel's a guy, not a girl. Um, he had been teasing me about like having like, uh, <laughs> we always joke around about it. <laughs> uh, Next time, but and I'll be like, wait a minute, the guy Angel or the girl Angel? I don't know. No, we'd always, uh, but Angel and I always joke around about like how, like, uh, he'll be like, uh, I'm, they'll be like, what's your name? I'll be Angel Garcia. I'm like, and just so you know, that's a guy's name, not a girl's name, but we'll mess with them. Um, but what I was saying is that, um, I was buying a car and the guy was offering it to me like for $33,000 or 35, somewhere around there. And I was trying to negotiate like $5,000. I'm like, I want it for 30 grand. If you don't give it to me for 30 grand, I'm going to walk away. But like, typical car stuff that you do the guy literally takes me in the back he pulls out the file for the car he goes look i'm completely transparent with you this is how much i bought the car for this is how much i invested in the car this is how much 
I've invested shows me a net of $32,000. He's like, look, I'll sell it to you for 34. I bought it. I'm all in for 32. I'm making $2,000. What did I do? I bought the car immediately. Why? Because the guy built up trust right away. So the moral of the story is a way to build up trust is to show rather than tell, meaning show them like, so I found that in presentations, most of the sellers have a lot of the same questions or a lot of the same problems. In some cases, I could easily answer those questions. And in some cases, I can basically show them. So they may say, do people really submit multiple offers on properties? Or how do you respond if somebody submits a multiple counter offer? So instead of me just telling them, I may tell them and show them an example of a multiple counter offer situation. I may be like, well, look, that's actually a really good question. This is the way that our process works. Here's a situation where the seller had multiple offers. Here's an outline of every single one of the offers. This is what they came in originally. This is how we countered. This is this. So what I find is that sometimes whenever you just tell somebody something, they're like, whatever. But when you show them something, it builds transparency and that transparency builds trust. So in a lot of my presentation, I'm showing them things as opposed to just telling them things. So what comes and that up, builds up trust the same way that that car person built up trust with me and it led with the sale. And guess what happened when I presented in that manner? That car person, I went back to him when I was looking to buy the next car because I liked the style so much because it was so transparent and because I trusted him. Yeah, so the formula for, for cultivating trust is be unattached to the outcome, put their yours and be transparent. Be transparent. Build up and build up transparency. And if you do that, like you'll win. And then, and then just recognize guys. Like it's, it's funny. I had a one-on-one coaching call with a guy and he was like, oh man, you know, I set three appointments the first week in January. Two didn't work out and I wrote a contract and it didn't come to fruition. And I was like, bro, like what popped into my head was like little Nemo. Like just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Like, what is the expectation? You think everybody's going to bow down to you because like you fucking woke up at 5.30 in the morning? Like, it's not how it works. Most, I spoke to 7,000 people one year. John, I got 142 to say yes. That's a lot of yeses, guys. But, but you know what I'm saying? That's like 2%. But I'm just saying, guys, like that's what is required. That's just what it is. You're going to hear no, most of the shit you put energy to won't work out. It just won't. And you just need to understand that. So what I told them is like, look, you know, according to your numbers, I can see it, you know, uh, 50% of the appointments you go on don't work out. So it's like, or that you set don't work out. So what's happening is is you're setting like one and thinking like you're done for the week when you really should be setting three because one will fall out, one you'll go on and then get, you know what I'm saying? But he's already in January. Like, I don't know, bro. Well, I think one of the things that Aaron said to me, which I, I th- or said to people, which I think is good, is like the hardest part about real estate is not learning what to say. The hardest part about real estate is not like um, waking up and prospecting. The hardest thing is when things aren't going right, like that little voice in your head saying to you like, Hey, it's been three weeks. I prospected every day and I don't have a listing that I've taken. Like, is this even working? Like, that's the hard part about the business when it's like. I get like PMs on the regular, like, hey, bro, uh, for the last two days, um, this has been happening. (laughs) I'm like, dude, for the last two days, like, get it together, bro. And it happens more at this particular time of the year as well. It's not like really working, guys. It's like, come on, bro. It's going to take a while. So the the main takeaway here, guys, is look, I want everybody to be clear on something. Again, one of the main voices in our space has suggested an approach that is confrontational, that is um, abrasive, that is my way or the highway, that is egocentric. I am the shit. And if you're with me, great. And if you're not, like you know fuck you you know what i'm saying like that's the approach and what i need you to understand is that is a finite player they're playing a finite game the problem is is that business is an infinite game 
When infinite players go up against finite players, the finite player loses almost every time. So infinite is Jose saying like, yeah, the formula that we just gave you, look, I'm going to attach to the outcome. Whatever you decide, I'll support you 100%. The second is, is like, I put your interest in front of mine. You know, if it makes sense to do it, we'll do it. If it doesn't, that's okay too. And if it makes sense to go with another option, I'll let you know that as well. You know, I have the good fortune. I help a lot of people. So if for some reason we don't do business, it's okay. Right. And then the third is to be transparent. Transparent in like what is really true. So somebody asks you like, hey, John, do you do open houses? It's like, well, you know, we can. You know, for some people, it's it's important to them. I'm curious, is it important to you? And John's like, yeah, God damn it. I bought my house in an open house. Okay, great. So we can do it. <laughs> if he's like, well, I'm not really sure. I was just asking your opinion. It's like, well, you know, we'll do whatever you want. Like, you know, you're the boss here. My job is just to help you to make an informed decision. It's never to talk you into doing anything. What I'm aware of is statistically, according to the Association of Realtors, an open house only sells the home that you're sitting in 1% of the time. Can I share with you the nitty gritty of our business? What's that? It's really just a mechanism for agents to find buyers to sell them other homes. Now I'm wondering, would you want me as your agent that you hired to sell your home to spend my time trying to find people other homes or spend all of my time trying to sell your home? Which would you prefer? Well, I want you to sell my home, damn it. Great. So then you're beginning to see why typically we don't do the open houses because we don't find them to be very effective. Sounds like you would rather me spend all my time and energy on things that are actually effective and efficient and have a better than 1% chance of getting your home sold. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, great. And then you move on. But notice I didn't make him wrong. I wasn't like, oh, that's stupid or dumb. I'm like, hey, John, is that important to you? Tell me. Right? So as you shift, I'm telling you guys, it is a qualitative shift, not quantitative. 10x, 2x thinking is linear. Right? I'll just do more of what I'm doing now, just harder and faster. The problem is, is it always leads to linear outcomes. Always. And this is some did the 2x for a long time. 10x, you can't work 10x harder. Okay. Everybody on this call, listen to me, who are listening to Goggins and fucking all these people. You can't work 10x harder. It's not possible. In order to get 10x outcomes, you need different strategies, different approaches, different techniques. You need leverage. What we're saying right now and what Jose is deploying and what I'm demonstrating is a radically different approach. And it will get you radically different outcomes. But you have to put your trust in an infallible process that if my intention is to connect with respect in an environment where I could be 100% authentic, I'm going to have a really good experience. And if I have a really good experience, the people that I'm with will probably have a really good experience too. If I mix in, I'm teaching, me and Jose are teaching you, and John, we're teaching you how to build a cake, okay? If I mix in being transparent, unattached to the outcome, and putting their interests before mine, and I mix in knowing what to say and how to say it and handle objections, guys, you will be a fucking rock star. And, and another way to build trust as well, too, is really care about your online reputation as well, too. So, like, obviously, like, uh, like they look you up on, like, we just had a review from a client, and before she hired us, she looked us up online, and that was one of the reasons. She's like, I looked up your reviews. Uh, everybody else was calling me. I looked up your reviews. I felt very comfortable with you, so I decided to meet with you. Then she liked the presentation. I built up trust. She hired me, and then she was one of the, five star reviews now that she left so as well too like like um a way to build up so think about like how important is it to build up trust um and and how important is it like if you don't if the other person doesn't know you if the other person already knows you it's you already had a lot of times you already have that trust but when the other individual does not know who you are that's one of the key things be like okay how can i build up trust with this individual so that we can proceed to the next step basically. Yeah, agreed. And you have to keep in mind, like our whole economic system is based on trust. So how are we, how is technology to what Jose is saying? How is it changing the way that we um, establish trust with others? Well, one is, is through these reviews, because that's no different than you in the past saying like, Hey, to your best friend, who should I talk to? But now Google is the biggest refer of people, right? You know what I'm saying? So like maintaining your digital presence and recognizing that it is important because that's how you make decisions of what gets your money, 
Yeah. When you go out to a restaurant, you go to Yelp or you go to one of these platforms, you look at the reviews, you look at the pictures, and that's who gets the $200 check that night. Like, that's how that works. So why am I not thinking that way for myself? The second way to cultivate trust and something that I've learned and Jose's learned and John's learned is through media. Because with media, people can decide over time when you share with them what you believe, not what you do. And that's how you guys do that wrong. Because you're like, oh, like, here's the four things and here's the five things and here's what we just did. You're just telling them what you do instead of what you believe. Because over time, people can decide if they know, like, and trust you, if they're in alignment with your values and who you are and what you stand for. And it becomes polarizing because, you know, you guys want to make everybody happy. You can't. It's not possible as your audience expands. So by sharing with people what you believe, it, you draw people to you, your tribe that believe the same thing, and you push people away that don't. It's just yeah. that many of you guys can't put up with the pushing away. You can't put up with the negative comments. You can't put up with somebody being like, oh, you're an asshole because you wear glasses inside or fucking, you know what I mean? Like you can't deal with that. I saw that. It's fucking hilarious. Hey, but did you see what I replied back? I'm like, yeah, it got you to comment. Got you to comment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, what was funny about that. I told the story to Jose where w w as I was doing the talk, I realized I still had the glasses on and I was like, oh, I should take these off. And then immediately and what popped into my head is like, nope people won't be able to resist commenting on them. And what the haters don't realize, check this out. So by stating what you believe, you pull people towards you and you push people away that don't. And what the haters do by commenting is get you in front of more people to find more, more of your tribe. That's right. 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 So, so Jose's like, it's accurate. And what we're doing, like we're just doing it on the fly. So it's not like uh, in a kind of linear manner, what we're sharing with you as far as how to cultivate trust, it's formulaic. So what we're saying is, is like, look, okay, come from a place of contribution, put them, their needs in front of yours, be transparent, be unattached to the outcome, right? Then look for what problems they have and figure out a way to solve them. Then like have a, uh, reviews that they can look at that, you know, from other people that you've worked with, then have media that they can watch. And all of this culminates in, can I trust John's side? Yeah. Even like I'm listening to this podcast. It's called Founders, and if you guys haven't listened to that podcast, it's great. It's about a guy that literally reads autobiographies and then gives you like like a summary of the autobiography and combines it with like over 300 autobiographies that he's read. And he was giving one about Warren Buffett's favorite CEO, and the his favorite CEO was a lady who owned a furniture store in Nebraska. And her business model was very simple. Her business model was whatever it cost me, I will I will add ten percent profit to that whatever it cost me, and I will sell it to you at a ten percent profit margin. What ended up happening is that that business model built up so much trust that the people would be so happy because they were getting a good deal because they were always, no matter what, only getting a ten percent markup that they would go buy and then they'd go buy again because they knew that the person was only making 10% and the person would show them the receipts of everything. Then the uh, what it led is they would come back, they would tell their friends, family, and neighbors. She built a business where she would make $60 million in profit every single year with that business model. And I was like, I was like what I took from that is she built up trust. So in our industry, how can we build more trust? That is the key. How can we present in a way where it builds up trust? How can we present in a way where it builds up transparency? How can we build in, how can we present in a way where it solves people's problems? Solving people's problems, build trust. Transparency, um, same thing as trust. Transparency, online reputation, um, media right yeah. all these things are combined in one like building trust is yeah. go trust and, and what i heard um the other day is business moves at a speed of trust so you know the three factors uh in doing business with somebody uh is know you like you trust you trust right? you so, it, you know, it, that's why we put ourselves out there so much to have enough content that when people want to follow us, it's automatic that um, if you follow me and like my content and when you reach out to me, it's already pre-sold. Yeah. So that's why we do it. Right. 
Um, hey, do we have anybody that wants to role play or have any questions <laughs> for us? We've been talking for a long time. Obviously, this is a role play call. So come on, let's go. Anybody? The shy crowd on uh, on Zoom, and not many people I, on camera. I got a it's question. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Ilya, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, what are your suggestions, recommendations for door knocking experts? Like just started doing it yesterday, had terrible two experiences, but you know, want to try to do more. You said terrible two experiences. Like, what, what do you mean by that? Um, first guy that opened it was son of the owner that was selling and he was just like no i don't know nothing uh just go um we don't need anything and i couldn't like i, I was just froze i froze i didn't know what to say because it was not the owner himself and, and the second one uh not exactly terrible but uh, the neighbors uh, who i've met basically bought the unit and it took it off the market and they are selling with the uh and same realtor in other units. The, yeah, so again, unit. like this goes back to what I was saying before, Ilya. It's like it's your expectation. The fact that you think somebody saying no to you is terrible means that you're yeah, thinking not... like most of the people that you talk to are gonna do that. 98 fucking percent of them will do that. Like you need to change the way you think. You're imagining that you're okay, you're looking for an approach where everybody says yes all the time. That is not a realistic expectation. And the longer it takes for you to come to the realization, the accurate assessment of reality, that 98% of everybody you speak to will say no, you will constantly be like battling yourself internally. You'll constantly be bouncing around to different approaches. Everything works if you work it, but most of the shit that you do will not like work out. Yeah. Uh, I re realized that I just, you know, uh, by terrible, I was describing more of a feeling I got by first door knocking it. Right, you know, part of the they're knocking feeling, anything. Again, I need you to understand the feeling is yeah. associated with your expectation. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you had an expectation that 98% of the fucking interactions will go like that, would you be upset or mad when that happens? Hmm. No, no, I, I get it. No, get would it. you have a feeling of like, ooh, that was tough? No, like you wouldn't care. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the thing is it's expectations. I Like, first of all, it's a win. So you're, you're only imagining, again, this is flaws in thinking. You're imagining that a win is when they open the door, invite you in, and you list the property on the spot. You know what a fucking win is? That you actually did it. Mm. Because most people fucking don't. That's the win. You're focused on the wrong thing. And what you're focused on is what you feel. What you feel is your emotional home. See, you're focused on, oh, that was like a terrible... It's even in your language, bro. Life and death is in the tongue from the Bible. You can breathe something into existence or you can tear it down. When you said, I had a terrible experience, what feelings are associated with terrible? Not good. But it has to yep. do with what you're focused on. If you focused on the fact like, you know what, man? I fucking overcame my fear. I knocked on two people's doors, and that's a fucking win. How would you feel? Good. Yes, but instead, you're focused on something else, and that's how you feel. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's not an issue of, like, technique. It's not like you need to wear fucking glasses or you need to change your hair color. It's none of that, dude. It's an issue of thinking. My thinking's flawed. Yeah. So first of all, great job, Ilya, for knocking on doors, right? And nothing means anything until you put meaning into it. So feel the win already when you have taken the action. Don't attach wins to only results, but to the actions taken. You said you were going to do something. You actually went out there and did it. That's first and foremost. And then whatever happens, happens. You can't control that the person that opened the door was the son of the owner. You can't control that, mm -hmm. right? But you, what you did control was, Aaron talked about last week, is dominating your controllables, which you did. So congratulations. Well, yeah, you're also building trust in yourself because, okay, when, when people say to me, they're like, oh, well, you know, I need to be more confident. I'm like, all right, well, what do you think that word means? And they're like, well, you know, like, knowing what I'm doing, fucking, you know, I don't know, like, give me all these different answers. But the Latin derivative of the word confidence is confianza. What that word means is to trust. 
So if you had a really, let, let's say you had a buddy who like, you know, is going to go to the gym with you. They're like, yeah, I'm all fucking in. We're going to go to the gym. We're going to, you know, it's new me, new fucking whatever the fuck they say. Right. And they don't show up for two weeks. Here's my question. Would you believe them anymore? No. Would you trust them anymore? No. But we do this with ourselves. You say you're going to do something and you don't fucking show up. So you know what starts to happen? You stop believing in yourself. And then you know what starts to happen? You stop trusting yourself. So then this bullshit pops into your head. It's like, well, you know, Ilya, like you make promises before and like you didn't fucking do this. So you're not going to do this one. Like that's what happens. So the two wins that you can take from that is one, you actually did it. Most people don't. Two, that's one step to cultivating trust, which is another way of saying confidence. You understand? People, opportunities flow to people that are reliable, that reliably show up, that reliably do what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it. Most people aren't reliable. So that is a win. And I promise you, if you shift that thinking, you will feel completely different about what transpired. I love that. The, you know, the, the, the other thing I was going to say, Elia, is uh, con one congratulations on um, on getting out there, um, and then obviously it's going to be a numbers game. Like so, uh, Aaron said that he talked to seven thousand people. A hundred and forty of them said yes. I remember one of my first years, I went like on a hundred appointments and. Um, I only took like five or something like that. So it, even after setting the appointment, I would go on the appointment appointments and my close race closing ratio was very low. What, what I would say to you is if, if like you got st st the, the, the objections that you get in person are going to be very similar to the ones that you get in the phone. So like, for example, like how many times on the phone? do they say like, oh, I'm not the owner, Daddy, right? Daddy. And then what do you say if they say I'm not the owner? Great. W would you happen to have a better phone number for the owner? Or oh, would you gross. happen to know the owner? Or do you know if the owner is still interested in selling? Can I leave a message for him? Can, I, can you tell him that I may have a potential buyer for the property and to call me ASAP if he's looking to sell? Here's my business card. Here's my phone number. If, if they say, well... I'm listing with the same person that has another listing that I have that I'm going to be listing or whatever. It's the same objection as I've already got another eight. So the objections that you get in person are going to be the same ones that you get in the phone. And if you get stomped, it's not a bad thing. It's going to happen. The main thing is you, um, you going out there and doing it. Now it also comes down to what do you do with that? So what I would recommend to you is, Whenever you get objections, come to them with this call, to this call, volunteer at the very beginning and say, hey guys, this week I got this, this, and this objection. These are the three objections that I want to work on. And then, because you're an elite builder, you can go back and listen to the recording, write out what we said, and then practice what we said, and then you're improving. The bad thing is not that you got that objection. You didn't know what to handle it. The, the, the bad part would be if you got that objection a hundred times over your career and you still don't learn the answer. So like, meaning like I got tired of hearing I've got another agent and not knowing how to handle it. So what did I do? I did something about it. I literally would ask Aaron, what do you, how do you handle this? He would tell me, I would write it out. Then I would go to John and be like, hey, John, what are you what are you working on? I'm like, I'm working on, I've already got another agent. And I'd role play that one thing over and over until I got it right. So the thing is like, what do you do with the things that you didn't know what to say? And how much of a student are you after the fact? Meaning like, are you coming to these calls and being like, okay, like, like I've got these three objections. How would you handle them? Okay, I like this, this, and this. You write it down then you practice it and then you do it again. I got these three objections. How would you handle this? And those three objections can't be the same one over and over, you know, like it can't be like, uh, like it, it, it's coming to these calls. So like football play, like bat professional football players, they go to, a, they have a game 
And what do they do after the game if they lose or win? The good ones. What do they do? They probably work they, out whatever they didn't work for them. They watch film. Oh. Like, they watch film. If you're going to go against an opponent, what do they do? They watch film. They're like, oh, if you're a baseball player, this pitcher. Y- yes, son. Yes, son. Orita, come here. Orita, ben. Ben. Um, ben. Orita, say hi. Okay. So what do they do? No, okay. <laughs> I just got a foot on the phone. All right, guys. They watch film, basically. They watch film and they study the film. So that's what you're doing here. So when you come here, come with the two or three things that you got that you didn't know how to handle. We'll tell you how to handle them. You listen back to the video, you write out the script, and then you start practicing those. So what I would be taking, this is so simple. It's like, okay, what did they tell me? He told me my son is here. Okay, next 10 objections, next 10 role plays that you have, have them tell you, have them knock on the door and be like, oh, uh, I'm not the owner of the property. And then work on that. And then next 10 pre- role plays that you have, have them tell you, um, uh, I, I already have another real estate agent or I already have or tell you that same exact scenario that you did and work on it until you start feeling comfortable. And what's going to happen is that you're going to work on things until you start feeling comfortable and confident. And then the next time you get them, you're going to be able to handle them. Guess what, guys? The objections aren't going to change. Meaning like, I promise you, you're going to get that same objection in the future. So if you know that you're going to get that same objection, learn the answer. That's right. Right? Yulia, you got it, man. Well, congratulations on showing up today. I got to tell you, you know, before we go here, Jose must have worked on that objection for a whole year straight. I've got, I've already got another agent. I was like, oh, can we work on something else? But he's like, nope, I've already got another agent. And we worked on that over and over and over and over until he got it. Then he started signing contracts like, like it was clockwork, right? So uh, let's work on that next week, Ilya. All right, Jose, last insight for the audience. I, I would just say, Ilya, congratulations on door knocking. I've told that advice to multiple people and very few have done them. You're mm. already a step ahead of most people. So great job on that. My advice is keep going. Don't stop. Just keep doing it, but be a student as well too. Meaning whenever you get those objections, write down as you're prospecting, write down what you're going to get and pop on this call or the Friday call and say, Hey guys, I got this objection. How would you handle it? Go back, review it, write it out, and practice it. Great advice. Thank you. All right, guys. Make it a great day. We'll see you all back here next week. Adios. Bye-bye.